just wanted to give a, a little bit of an intro to this. Um, who knows how long it'll take? I don't know. Um, but part of it is is because uh, it this unlike some of the other texts, uh, what we read preceding this. I, I am not sure that the close, you know, uh, super uber, uber close reading of the whole text is going to be as influential and useful here. Um, I think some of it, yeah. Um, I think uh, other parts, maybe not so much. Um, so I'm kind of thinking out how I'm going to do it uh, still. Um, the first sec session here, we all, we'll do like the close reading like we've done in the past. Um, but going forward, I might just like choose selections from a series of pages and say, hey, we're dealing with these pages. Here they are if you want to read them, you know, um, and you can read it outside of, of it. And then maybe I'll give a, a, a summary um, of it, it as well as like we'll read the key parts of the text. So uh, also, yeah, I am lazy and I, I like scribble notes on little random sheets uh, as I read the text and read the secondary text. Um, I just typed them up into a Word document and I put them, like I tried to have AI make a PowerPoint from my Word document outline and failed miserably. Um, and, uh, but eventually was able to at least like go from a, the outline in, in Word to a PowerPoint. Um, and then I had the AI designer in PowerPoint come up with the images. Uh, which I thought that this image as the title slide was funny, probably because it has capital in it. Um, but it's like, you know, from the, the the perspective of like, you know, liberal economists, uh, the bear in the bull market as a, you know, which is like so antithetical to our whole position on capital uh, here. So that's okay. Anyways, long winded explanation of the whole where we're going, but. Uh, just a little bit of background from this text. I, I shared the a PDF of this book um, by Mark. But, I mean, it's 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 an excerpt from that from the Grandrissa, which is that bigger set of notebooks we read from the last two sessions. Um, but that te the, the actual Grandrissa wasn't published in English until oh I don't know when um, later than this came out. So that this text came out in English. Uh, which is a selection uh, section of in the Grundrisse before the full Grundrisse came out in English, um, and and it comes along with a really great introduction by Eric Hobsbawm, who's a um, fairly famous, I mean, British social historian. If you've read things like, uh, oh, what's one of the books like uh, Empire, the Age of Empire? What's another one? I can't think of any of the tales, but he has like a whole series, the Age of Capital. The age of et cetera, et cetera. Um, the age of all these different things. Uh, but then he also did other stuff like he has this book I'm looking at right now on my shelf called Primitive Rebels, and where he dealt with different uh figures throughout history uh, that kind of went against the grain. He's a he's he's a really prolific writer. He's influential in in especially like Marxian historical thought. Um but but his introduction's okay. I mean, I, I it, it it's worth reading, especially to kind of digest the text. I mean, he's writing it, like I said, in in sixty five, so it's not super super up to date, um, but it is you know does put it already, you know, looking at the text a hundred years later. Um, so anyway, so the whole notebook's written eighteen fifty seven to fifty eight. So just for like our timeline here, right? This is along the same time. Uh, near the end of when Marx was writing his stuff on India, so 1857, he wrote the second bit on India, where he kind of, um, if you remember, like in 1853, he was pretty uh, imperialist and like, you know, oh, the British will bring them into civilization. And by 1857, he was like kind of reprimanding the British, actually, and 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 had abandoned some of that weird uh, teleological imperialism that we saw in things like uh, uh, the, the Manifesto. Um, but we why it's important that these are notebooks is because we get to see Marx thinking things out. Um, that makes interpretation difficult. Um, but what we're following is really it's it's lines of thought less than something like a chapter in a book, right? Especially with a lot of contemporary academic books, you know, they get broken into chapters which are almost standalone, right? Especially the the model of, you know, you publish an article, you publish several articles, and you put them together in a book, right? 
in the Grandrissa, what we really kind of see is like thought, thought flowing from one into another. Um, so this section in that text is called forms which precede capitalist production. And then there's a parenthetical here, which is concerning the process which precedes the formation of the capital relation or of original accumulation. And this follows immediately after the section that we dealt with last time and the time before that on original accumulation of capital, which you might remember was having to do with, you know, capital is this self-positing system. How did it come to be that way? Right. So, so we need to, you know, and I'll talk about this more. We need to bear that in mind, right? This isn't Marx saying, okay, I'm now going to write a chapter on the history of economic situations. That's not what this is. And that's part of the reason this book, which is great for getting the text out, um, the people, if you don't know that, if you don't go and read it in the Grandrissi, you might take it as, oh, this is Marx doing broad brush social history or anthropology, um, which it, it is, but it also isn't. Um, the the notebooks uh and then like i said this this text so that, so, so that was published in moscow and russian in 39 to 41 the the number of texts that that were kind of after 1917 uh marxist history gets really complicated let's just say that with with the text like like things that 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 like the fact that this was in an archive there and they're like oh we should probably publish that or like the 1844 all of this stuff um, and then in Berlin, uh, this uh, this selection, so just on the pre-capitalist economic formations, was published as a pamphlet in 52. Full text of the Grundrisse came in 53. And then we get this text, 65. Hobbs, Hobbsbaum does the intro. Um, I want to point out that this text has been immensely influential. Um, so there's there's several things, but especially, you know, these, this is a list of thinkers, uh, just names that are out there, Solens. Who's an anthropologist, Mela Su, who wrote this book. And I was lazy again. I didn't look up pictures, but this book called uh, Maidens, Meal and Money, Capitalism, Domestic Community, which is about kind of uh, uh, the domestic mode of production or the household mode of production and capitalism's interaction with that. You've got folks like Eric Wolf writing Europe and the People uh, Without History, um, looking at, at a, an array of different groups. You got Andre Gunder Frank, Wallerstein, you get so you get all of these from Wickham, who is a medieval historian, Haldone, who's who's really of of, of the of uh, the Byzantine Empire, and you get a, a series of Hilton uh, was a he's a British historian. Um, so there's there's all these names, which which are fairly big names in like social history and Marxist history, are influenced by this. Um, and there's a lot of debates. So like 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 a lot of these like <laughs> they're not all in agreement either. Um, and this may not seem that important, but but I, I try to contextualize this text because, well, you'll see in a minute, but, um, and then several traditions. So British and Argentine social history, uh, and there was actually like a very uh, interesting reciprocation of, of, of ideas between these groups. Um, the French and Al school, so this would be like uh, Fernand Braudel, you get, and then you get world systems theory with Wallerstein and Frank, you get peasant studies, which is a whole separate discipline. You have folks like uh, Richard v Wilk, um, Alexander Chayanov, who who wrote a whole thing, um, I'm probably going to do a session on this book, uh, just because I I think especially related to Marin. But uh, basically, this is the transformation of the peasant economy within a market economy, um, and then and then obviously within anthropology, this part is 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 fairly famous because it's like Marx doing anthropology, um, which I do want to debunk. You know, there's some text. There's I think there's even a book called Marx as Anthropologist, which which Marx is not an anthropologist. Um, especially by the time he was reading this, we'll see he he hadn't even read hardly any anything that would remotely qualify as anthropology, um, and he for for sure wasn't actually doing field work, right? Uh, he he was getting all of his stuff the second hand, um, you know what 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 we might call his 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 quote unquote anthropology. The writings on India, for example, are the closest thing. Um, I mean, really, this this is like journal. I mean, it is journalism, right? It's for the New York Tribune. Um, so. And I, I've got a fair bit of intro here just because I think it's worthwhile if we're going to spend several weeks on this. Um, this The manuscripts of 1857 to 58, the Grundrisse was written as kind of Marx thinking through what he was going to say in the critique of uh, the of political economy, um, which is a text that came out in 1859 as well as Capital. Um, but in the preface to the critique of political economy, there's this statement which kind of become infamous. Um, and one reason it became infamous is because uh, the late 
coming out of this text, which was, you know, it's just Marx's notebooks. It wasn't published or anything. So until this text was published, which the glare, sorry, um, all we had <laughs> were scattered references that we've kind of traced in this this course. Um, but scattered references in capital volumes one, two, one and three, really. Um, but then this in the preface to the critique of political economy, where he says, in broad outline, the Asiatic, ancient, feudal, and modern bourgeois modes of production may be designated as epics marking progress in the economic development of society. And he doesn't really explain what those modes of production are. He doesn't really explain where they come from, how they interact, what he, um, you know, when he talks about they, they're marking the progress, how do those relate to this quote unquote progress of economic development? He doesn't really discuss that. Um, there um it's in in scholars have noted and and i've i've put this in here because i agree with it is that this tends to be a little bit more teleological um and more broad brush than the grand risa partly because there's none of the back it, he doesn't show where these things come from um so but this this gets picked this has gotten picked up and used um and and people have talked about it and and, and um you know, this paired with something like an 1853 journal article about how uh, Asiatic societies are stagnant uh, leads to a pretty uh, severe politic, um, right? When uh, going on in, in you know, uh, you know, Stalin talking about China and in, in, in inner Asia, etc. Um, so this is where again I say, bear with me. Right. Um, partly because we've got an explanation here. Um, but then also I, I'm basically I'm summarizing uh Hobsbawm's introduction is like I don't want to, I don't even know. It's like 75 pages. You know, it's it's a it's an ex, it's it's a very long introduction. So I, I read it, I'm summarizing it here so that you don't have to read it. You can if you want, but also adding in other things like Banaji's work, Eric Wolf's work, and then this great text um by I'm gonna have to I'm gonna struggle with the name, uh De Graca and Zingarelli. Which is 2015, um, which is about uh, modes of production and, and pre capitalist economies. Um, but but I wanted to start with this question. So, you know, will history die when historical study equals a study of the digital age? Which I, I couldn't think of a way to put it, but basically what I'm after here, like, are there, will there still be historical questions to ask um, in an era where, you know, where there were detailed, well preserved records of nearly everything? Right. In an era where everything is online, you know, and say it stays online, it's downloadable, et cetera, even with stuff, you know, I know stuff online doesn't stay there forever, but even so, right, like the archive of contemporary history, all the records, et cetera, is so much more immense than like even, you know, the 1850s or whatever. Um, will there still be questions to ask, historical questions to ask, you know, and 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 where this comes from partly is if we have if we know all of if we have enough information to answer any and all questions we want about x y or z event happening or taking place or whatever you know does that mean history goes away and it's the death of history we no longer have that and i mean like you probably all know uh, hopefully by now, right? That you know what my answers would be to this, um, which which is basically like, like no, right? You know, it's 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 more than just putting putting the horse in front of the cart, or you know, or or which one came first? How did we get from point A to point B, right? And one thing I just want to throw out: this is just high level history study of the past, right? Historiography, the study of the writing of history. So influences, traditions modes of inquiry how do you ask the questions you ask what sources are you using how are you reading those sources all of that would go under the ladder and all of that informs how many histories we have right you know and it doesn't go into you know this doesn't this isn't to say oh well every, anything can come out all narratives right um but but part of what what it is to say is that like even if we did have some sort of an archive right where we could answer concretely you know x y or z all of the facts we could line line them up right, we would still have questions to ask, right? And we would still be bringing with us some amount of, of historical theorization about how, uh, you know, from point A to point B or whatever it may be, um, which leads me to, to how knowledge works for Marx um, and for Hegel, 
you know, at least say, you know, for both of these, this is my thought, you know, um, and I would say that this, it kind of works in reverse, right? So like, let's think about capital, you know, Marx in capital, when does the chapter on the origin of capitalism come? It's, it comes at the end of the book. Marx starts out literally with the statement that the wealth of society, uh, the uh, social wealth and capitalism is a collection of commodities. He's saying, here's my starting point. Here's my conclusion right at the beginning he kind of puts he puts the cart before the horse and then and then makes it run backwards or something i don't know the the analogy didn't really work um so this is you know when when he's saying how knowledge works he you know what i mean by in reverse right is that he's not saying okay i know nothing i'm going to go look at history and 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 read these things and see if i can infer from this uh what happens right and and that's kind of less what he's he's after right he he's bringing something with it and this is where you know i've got a whole rant against grounded theory or positivism and naive empiricism um which, which is I, I oh i should have mentioned this for for marx and for for hegel i you know it it's um it's a speculative inquiry right and so Marx, Mar in so far as Marx is inferring, this is capitalist society, and this, and it's a self-positive system that has emerged. Based on that, what can we infer about the history that led to it, right? And you know, these 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 things where it's like, well, let's just look at the facts and then see what we need, right, or whatever it may be. I I actually think that this, you know, there there's a it's it's a it's a weird reversal here, right? Because people are worried. Well, if you bring these preconceived ideas to the facts, then you're gonna, you know basically fuck up and tell some terrible story and, and it's going to, you know, be biased or whatever. Right. But, but part of, and this is where I think, uh, reading marks can be informative to us. Right. Is if you assume something like, well, there's just the way things are, and I'm going to measure these things and I'm going to learn that X causes Z and that's why, you know, whatever the world is a square, um, which is, you know, part of the way, some of the way we go about contemporary economics or whatever it may be, the way Marx critiques bourgeois political economists for going about things, right, is that you actually risk a form of naturalization because you're taking the way that things are currently as a natural state and saying, oh, just the way things are. And this is going to lead me to a theory about how the way things have happened or, or the way things are. So it becomes like kind of a closed loop if that makes sense, whereas is, is, as, as looking at things kind of in reverse opens it up. Um, we can talk about that more in the book, um, which leads us partly to the question of whether, you know, is Marx even doing like history in this text, you know, in, in the traditional sense? You know, is he trying to write a history of the peasant commune? Is he trying to write a history of, of Oriental society? It's not, you know, no, like, his, you know, as, as Hobsbawm says in the intro to this, you know, it's not history in the strict sense. You know, Eric Wolf, he's neither a universal historian nor a historian of events, right? But if he's doing history, what he's doing, and this is why it's not history in the strict sense, but it might be history, is that he's looking at these configurations of material relationships, how society has organized itself through time at different times and in different spaces. Um, <clears throat> and then... There's this this other point that Marx came up with the pre-capitalist social formations, this list of primitive commune, uh, ancient mode, the feudal mode, um, the Asiatic mode, uh, etc. He, he came up with this list by looking at the, the record and, and saying, OK, so like if this is what is is, is come is, you know, if, if if this is kind of what what's in the record and this is my you know the historical materials perspective i'm bringing to this um showing that you know capital emerged from this um what that means is that that if he screwed up his observation that necessarily doesn't necessarily debunk the broader approach that he's bringing to the obs the the historical record so so i i put this in here because right it was written in 1857 if Wengro and Graeber can write a book called The Dawn of Everything, which literally just shits all over hist like history, history and historiography of the, the 20th century and a fair amount during the 21st century as well. 
then obviously the details, the 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 event type history in Marx is not going to be a hundred percent correct, kosher, whatever we want to call it. Um, but does that change the validity of his approach? Does that change the way that should should we still draw inspiration for doing historical work from Marx in the same way? And and I would argue that if if the facts if he gets the facts wrong, that that's probably do less to his approach than to the material he was working with. Um, which leads me to an outline of Marx's knowledge of pre-capitalist societies in 1857, uh, coming from people who actually trace this down and have more knowledge of German than I do, um, which is not hard. Um, so of ancient societies, Marx was literate in Latin and Greek. He could read these things. He did a, his, his dissertation was on Democritus or, and, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was classic classical scholarship. So he has the classical and literary sources. Um, so that on in that in that sense, he's probably up to speed with 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 contemporary scholars who would use the same sources. Um, but their archaeology wasn't up to date. Uh, a lot of less sites had been act, uh, excavated, and even the ones that were right, all the complex me methods we have of analyzing plant remains and pottery, etc., uh, didn't exist. There also weren't any inscriptions or or, or papyrus. Uh, uh, artifacts to deal with. So, so there's there's some there's a fair amount there, but not a lot. Oriental societies before 1848. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that Marx and Engels knew anything about Oriental societies. Uh, remember the the straight up racist comments in in the Manifesto of 1848 about like battering down Chinese walls and bringing barbarians into civilization. Um, this is probably based like 100 percent on uh, uh, on 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 Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history. Um, the, the studies on uh, Oriental societies really began in the 50s, um, not just Marx's journalism and, and, and being very in touch with, you know, getting these, these firsthand reports from over there, but he also began reading history. And there's a, there's a fair bit, um, like the summer of 1853, uh, he really took a deep dive into this, uh, these texts. I'm reading a lot of, of, of you know, they're Western, right? Historical accounts of places like India and China. Um, and during this time that Marx and Engels both were very into this to the extent that Engels was actually thinking it fitting to try to learn Persian to read ancient texts. Um, so just showing that like, you know, they, they, their, their knowledge of the Orient was definitely more, um, it was more than a cursory or a casual knowledge uh, of like, you know, of a learned individual. It was actually something that had involved some study. Um, regarding feudal societies, Marx was fairly concerned with feudal trade and laws, um, and, and he he'd done some work, you know, in, in like volume three, he draws on feudal work on on prices, um, but he didn't really concern like with peasant ag or serfdom and, and manorial systems a lot less so um, than like 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 uh, feudal uh, trade and taxes and cities. Um, peasant societies, not a whole lot of knowledge in 1857. Uh, Maurer, who who's influential on the later Marx, he put, put, I, I think he put out a book in 1854. Uh, you can fact check that. Uh, it's probably wrong. And then Prescott, who's an American author, who who did some stuff on on uh, the prehistoric Americas, um, who and, and who it is known that Marx read. Beyond that, there's you know classical authors like you know classic accounts of oh my travels here, explorers accounts or whatever. Um, and then some communal survivals in places in, in like Eastern Europe, particularly a lot of folks will read this and, and see the, uh, you know, the, 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 the epics, right? The Asiatic mode or, or the ancient mode, the feudal mode or ancient mode, slave mode, feudal mode, whatever, and, and, and try to project either this onto Morgan or Morgan onto this, who is this anthropologist and in, in, who put out this famous book, ancient society in 1877. But the history does, you know, it just doesn't line up. Marx, he did read this book; it was really influential. Uh, he he read it shortly after it came out, uh, but in terms of his, his early work here, I mean, we're twenty years before Morgan's even relevant. Um, before Morgan was writing the book, um, so just clear clarity. Um, again, hitting this point again uh, because you know, in terms of the actual history, things might be muddled, wrong, or updated now. Uh, but we should we should try to be more interested in the questions Marx is asking and how he's writing them. Yeah, and Engels wrote the peasant. Yeah, 
and angles had a a stronger um kind of anthropological interest than Marx. Um, and he'd, he'd done more reading on peasant societies and feudal uh, agriculture than Marx. Um, and actually in 1880, I don't know, uh, maybe four, he wrote a book called The Mark, which is on an old German peasant commune society um, influenced by Maurer. Um, so, so yeah, so Engels, a lot of the anthropo, and Engels was also up on archaeology. Um, uh, but it but it comes after this text, yeah. Um, so questions, and, and so yeah, so in this text, we should think more like what questions is Marx really asking, and how is he going about getting an answer for them, as opposed to what answers does he arrive at? One way of saying this is instead of thinking about okay, um, is this society a mode of production or not, or is it this mode of production, or is this how he describes the society is that really right or not? Um. I think to, to say, hey, that's wrong and correct it, that's fine. But to to just to let that distract us from the broader point of the text and the reason Marx is writing it would be a mistake. Um, because really, right, Marx is taking it as his starting point that capital emerged from a certain historical trajectory. And he laid out these preconditions and presuppositions uh in the prior bit that we read on the accumulate the original accumulation if you remember that there were like i think there were four presuppositions the separation of 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 labor from its subjective the objective conditions of its existence was a major one i cannot remember the others which is terrible i should get them um so it's important that we don't forget marx's purpose for writing this text right um remember those readings from the last couple of meetings and i'm just going to grab the book so it doesn't bug me here. Um, so we should remember, right? He 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 writes. Um, let me find get to it. He lists these four presuppositions. You know the uh, of the becoming of the arising of capital, which include. Oh no. Yeah. The presence of living labor uh, is so separated from the conditions of its existence. Objectified labor is found on the other side um, with an accumulation of use values. So like money to pay the, a free laborer, right? And then you have to have free exchange. In other words, you know, exchange related to us as independent and free actors on a market, not as, you know, uh, you know, Lori's the queen, so I've got to pay her a tax or whatever. Um, and then the fourth one, which is uh, the uh, labor presents itself purely as something that can create value, not as something that can create a thing for use, but as something that can create value or lead to monetary. So those are the four preconditions, right? So so we should ask then, you know, if this comes immediately before, then why in the hell does Marx go into, four, you know, it's 45 pages or whatever in, in the grand, in this text, it's 45 pages worth talking about these pre-capitalist societies. And, you know, really, we should understand the whole thread of this text as we read it, not as some sort of history of 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 the way things have progressed through time or something right but but the becoming of capital's dominance how did capitalism emerge from whatever is it you know how, how did, what 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 are the conditions that led to the emergence of capitalism um in other words how did capitalism emerge as a self-positing totality based on those presuppositions that i just mentioned so we've always got to read this text thinking about how it points towards the development of the presuppositions for capitalism's emergence as a self-positing system. And this will be, uh, you know, it'll be important in this text to kind of differentiate, you know, that in, in, in you know, Marx questioning like, okay, so there, here's this precondition. If it was like this before, what led to, you know, say, you know, uh, if if people had access to the means of their subsistence before and now they don't, what led to that, right? Um as opposed to some of his historical digressions or things where he kind of uh, tacks on a, a Victorian uh, ontology 
um, <laughs> or, or so, a Victorian social ontology about you know human as a social social animal or or whatever it may be um, just brings this kind of out there. Um, placing this text in our course, uh, you know, Marx was concerned with pre-capitalist societies really at only two periods. I mean, primarily at two periods in his life. Um, we're dealing with the first one of those, which is the 1850s. Um, in and when he was writing the Grundrisse, and, and that what were this pre what's collected in this book primarily concerns that period, and and the goal here is really to understand the becoming of capital. Um, this was a revised and not really like he doesn't like return to this. Like it's not like, uh, you know, he 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 doesn't really, uh, you know, in capital he's not he's not plotting the whole whole thing around, uh, these, uh, these you know whatever modes of production or epics. Um, and then the other time when he was concerned was 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 after uh, Capital Volume One comes out. Is quote is it's really the eighteen seventies is really, um, and, and people are like, well, maybe this is because he was concerned with Russia as a revolutionary place. So that's why he was reading all this stuff. Um, I'm not really sure if that's the case. Um, and I'm not going to reveal all the cards because that's where we're headed with this course. Um, there's two key concepts. Um, we're almost done. Sorry, I. Um, trying to give some context before we just jump in to be like reading about like, here's a primitive commune where like everybody is an equal and loves each other. Um, so two key concepts here. The first is the mode of production. Um, both of these concepts are are, are debatable. Um, in their book, actually, uh, De Graca and uh, uh, Zingarelli, they, they're like introduction spends like 20 pages like laying out all the different perspectives, like one sentence is according to so and so, this means this. Another perspective is that this means this. So there's a lot going on in these concepts. They're not a hundred percent sell, and people think different things about them. Um, so when we think about a mode of production, uh, there's two definitions here. One is the social configuration course. So they say in their in this book, people adopt two definitions, and these are the ones they list. And and I think these are pretty good capturing almost all of uh, of the way that this term is used. Um, the social configuration corresponding to certain relations of production. So this would be like the way or labor is organized, who does what labor, when, where, why, and how, um, you know, more or less associated to a certain development of productive forces. Productive forces would be like, uh, you know, well, how do I put it? This is kind of like the material means, right? So today it would be like computers and AI and, and digital, et cetera. It was industry. And, you know, when Marx was writing the industrial revolution and it was steam and all of this. And then earlier on, it might've been, you know, animal energy and, uh, and whatever, right? So, so it's how labor's, you know, who does what, when, where, and why, as that corresponds to a certain level of technological development, we might think about it um, that way. That's what that statement's saying. And then the second one is you, you get a combination of both these four, Productive forces in the relations of production that express themselves uh, via certain property relations. I think the second, I don't like the second one as much, um, partly because I, I think putting the productive forces on equal footing with relations of production leads to a certain kind of uh, economic or technological determinism, sometimes really badly with folks like Carl Wittfogel and Oriental Despotism, who literally said, here's the uh, here's the um, economic base, right? And, and 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 because of that, you have like you know uh, despotic societies. Um, and that's a gloss, but it, it's it's all you need to know about with Fogel, I guess. Um, so another definition from Wolf, who who puts it a little bit more clearly, he th he calls mode of production. And and this book is from a, a very famous book called Europe and the People Without History. Um, he says, uh, mode of production is a specific historically occurring set of social relations through which labor is deployed to wrest energy from nature by means of tools, skills, organization, and knowledge. I really like that definition. It's basically, again, how is labor organized? Uh, what what skills and knowledge are employed doing it? You know, who does what, when, where, why, and how? That's really, I mean, that's uh, what I'm after here. Um, and then Banaji, who's who I, I put this quote on because he's kind of been he pushes back against the mode of production concept, um, basically because of the way it's been used a lot. Um, and he says that relations of production are not reducible to forms of exploitation of labor. 
So an example of, of reducing relations of production to forms of exploitation of labor would be saying the U.S. plantation system in the American South during the 18, you know, the 1800s uh, and before, I guess, actually, um, was a was a was a slave mode of production. Uh, because in in the South, slavery was the primary form of exploitation. But Najee's and and, and Marx Marx dis, would disagree with it, as we know when we read his stuff on the Civil War. He he literally referred to it as as, as like plant as slave based capitalism. Like it. Um, so this would be an example of saying, well, what's the primary form of exploitation? Slavery. All right. So this is a slave form of society. But really, right, the American South during that time uh, is is if you look at at the relation of the production, why is that labor being done with this with the surplus that's garnered from it? What is going on? Um, it's a capitalist uh, social system, right? So that this is an example of of kind of Banaji's intervention, which I think is really um, profound and useful. Um, social formation. So you've probably noticed throughout this course, I'll talk about the capitalist social formation. Uh, or a capitalist society, I won't really talk about a capitalist mode of production. Um, that's partly because I think mode of production is a little narrower. Um, if you're going to talk about capitalism as exists today, um, you can talk about you know the capitalist mode of production, but that's really talking about these relations of production. When we talk about society as a whole, we would use something like the social formation. Um, there's less consensus around this than mode of production, at least in my estimation. Um, and I think about this as the social whole or the social totality. Uh, Lenin used it to talk about um, a combination of modes of production in a specific hierarchical articulation, as well as the rest of society. Um, so uh, Emilio Sereni talked about it as the totality of, we could basically say the mode of production as well as the superstructural elements in the in their historical progression. Um, so so in this mode of production really it's like the economics um when you talk about a social formation you would talk about like the influence of liberalism um right or or in in the u.s you could talk about uh you know the way uh the mode of, the capitalist mode of production has interacted with whatever we want to you know uh american ra uh, racism or uh you know the you know agrarian ideal or uh, you know what 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 might you know right wing populism or whatever it is right and, and and how that constitutes the social formation today, um, and and part of the the value of a social formation is that it can include a combination of relations. Um, so, right, like in the capitalist social formation, you have non capitalist relations going on, right? The family, um, you know, the you have different communes, etc., right? Um, so you can have this. You can have whole sectors of, you know, parts of the social formation that that are maybe, uh, you know, you've got a bunch of peasant farmers, um, right? But maybe uh, their surplus is extracted, um, and uh, you know, used to invest in I don't know better tools or something. Um, by by, uh, so there's different ways that things can kind of line up. So so you can see it gets pretty complex. It's not really a cut and dry. Well, there's this society and this society and this society. So pick pick your type and you know identify which one it is, right? But it's really like an an analytic lens by which you can pair things together and look at different existing social formations, right? To see how different existing social formations that involve different modes of production might, for example, interact, right? or how the capitalist mode of production interacts with other modes of production in particular social formations. Does that make sense-ish? We'll deal with these concepts as we go through the text too. Um, but you can say, I, yeah, I prefer this concept. It, it, it solves, for example, Banaji's issue there. Um, and it, mode of production carries a lot of baggage. Um, some pitfalls to avoid as we get into the text. Um, trying to map epics to areas. So, oh, the ancient mode, you know, so this is only ancient Greece and Rome from this to this, right? Or it's only societies that existed at this time frame. Or, uh, oh, Asiatic mode of production, that only existed in Asia, uh, you know, which, which folks have kind of jettisoned that term and talk about it as the tributary mode. It has less to do with any sort of PC, anything than the fact that uh, recognizing that the mode of production 
Marx recognized in those Asiatic societies, it has existed in places like the Americas um, and in different different social formations. Um, and, and, and really that the gist of it is the tributary mode where, where there's some amount of tribute being extracted from um, a large uh, populous mass. Um, the other thing is is treating modes of production as ends of inquiry. And this is all the debates about like, well, is this society, this mode of production or this mode of production? Or what are the features that really categorize this mode of production? And, and you know, people like, like get up in arms about this and, and, you know, well, there's this mode of production and this mode of production. It becomes a whole thing about just outlining these categories or classification schemes. And I love this quote of, from Wolf on this, where he says that the utility of the concept of mode of production does not lie in classification. In other words, is uh, 14th century British feudal or peasant, you know, or is, you know, whatever, 17th century uh, Argentine, you know, or whatever, are the Incas, what are, what, how do we classify them? You know, the utility of the concept of the mode of production does not lie in that type of work, right? This is just like a typology of, of, of societies that have existed across time and space, which doesn't really have any, you know, it, it's just like 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 counting chips or something. There's just it, it has no analytical power really when it when it's re resorted to that. But um, you know, the utility lies in the concept's capacity to underline strategic relationships involved in the deployment of labor by organized human pluralities. So, in other words, to outline, you know, what are the politics that go on in this society versus this society, right? Or how I put it before, you know, when you're looking at, you know, okay, you have the Inca, how did they organize labor? And how was that linked to the way, you know, they interacted with these other groups around them or whatever it may be, right? Um, Wolf, you know, and this is how I really like the concept. I think he uses it well. It's, it's, it should be used as an analytic lens to study how capitalist modes of production interacted with non-capitalist modes. Um, and then the last pitfall, again, which I've already kind of addressed, is that we should avoid, you know, we should we should consider contemporary historical knowledge, right? Obviously, they like they didn't have radiocarbon dating when Marx was <laughs> writing, right? Um, but we should consider the, the contemporary historical knowledge in light of the right questions, by which I mean, you know, it's it's not about correcting Marx's details, right? But in terms of how we might better think about, oh, well, this society actually, you know, this, um, this was the way they organized their labor and they were doing this. And it shows that they were interacting with this group. How does that inform our knowledge about how, um, you know, uh, I don't know communal societies interacted with feudal societies or whatever uh, we might want to think about. So that's that. 